Sandra Goldstein, she was the first installed president of the commercial IC RCA. So this first woman president of this organization. Tony Puente, Miami-Dade College Hall of Fame member, outstanding contribution of real estate. And we have Rafael, and I didn't know about this about Rafael until yesterday. He's five-year veteran of the U U uh, U United States Navy. I didn't know that. So congratulations, thanks for your service. I, when I was reading his bio, I said, oh man, I know him for like four, four or five years, and I didn't know about this about you. So that's why I like you very much. <laughs> We're gonna start, <laughs> well, everybody likes him. We're gonna start with Sandra. What I want Sandra to do is uh, to tell us what's going on. <laughs> what's going on in the market, what's going on in, in, in what we do, and, and uh, from there we will we'll take it. I have some questions afterwards, and all right, Sandra, go ahead. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, a friend of mine, Ellen Kempler, once told me, who's a teacher, she said, teach what you want to learn. So I'm not a robot. I do things the old-fashioned way. I read articles. I talk to people. I talk to their nannies. I talk to their masseuse. I speak to their attorneys and their accountants, and I read the newspapers. And of course, I look at uh, information that's provided to us with our technology. And so this is my perspective of Miami-Dade County. But we have to look at the backdrop of what's happening to us. Miami has arrived as a global city. We're on a par with New York, London, and Singapore. And the things that are happening to us globally are affecting us. Oil uh, prices are, are lowering. Brexit has changed the economy. There are investors who are looking for preservation of capital. We have uh, jobs that are going for wanted here. We need affordable housing in this area. And uh, we have investors from Russia, Japan. We have them coming in from Qatar. United Arab Emirates are buying properties here. Um, and in addition to New York, New Jersey, the usual places, Brooklyn, we have investors coming in from Denver, San Diego, Texas, Chicago, Milwaukee. It's really amazing what is focusing here in Miami. And, and the thing that seems to be centered for us are land prices. People are buying land like never before, and the prices are crazy. They're going all over the map. And, and sooner or later, the question is not going to be, what is the hottest property in Miami, but what's the driest property? If you were to look at land prices on a scale of monopoly, you would have to say that the Design District and Wynwood are the Park Place and Broadway of the board. And if you looked at Hialeah and Northwest Dade, you would say that's probably Mediterranean. And the things that are happening along South Dixie Highway with transit-oriented development purchases and land in Coral Gables and further down South Dixie, that would be Atlantic. So let me give you some ideas of what the land prices are in <coughs> coming into this past year. In the area between Northwest 2nd Avenue and North Miami Avenue, and between 22nd and 27th Streets, sales are based on an average of $650 to a high of $1,561 a square foot based on land, and between 1200 and 1780 per square foot buildable for existing product. Red Sky Capital Buyer in September this year just paid $30 million, a direct uh, sale with Jessica Goldman. They paid $565 a square foot for a one and a half acre piece. That was a 3,000% increase from what the property had traded for in 2013. Redsky, which is a Brooklyn-based company, in joint venture with their London partner, is now likely the second largest owner in Wynwood. CoStar shows that they own about $250 million worth of real estate, second only probably to DACRA that's in combination with the Ashkenazi 
and the, uh, and the L Equities people who own 70% of the property in the design district. And that's followed closely by Moshe Manna, who owns probably almost $250 million worth of real estate and 30 different properties, not only in Wynwood, but also in Flagler. East End Capital also purchased in Wynwood. They paid $14.5 million for three warehouses in Wynwood, and they also just purchased 100 uh, Biscayne Boulevard, the office building, for $84 million. They like to be close to their projects. On another, uh, Alta Developers in S South Miami paid $14.4 million. That was a trade by Lika Sikos as the broker. They assembled three parcels of land for uh, $200 a square foot. And then interestingly, NP Developers, they're from Milwaukee, they bought five acres from Jeff Berkowitz and they're planning a mixed use development it's one of those transit-oriented developments that are sprouting up along South Dixie Highway. They've paid close to $500 a square foot. Another transit-oriented development in that area is the parcel that um, Gus Machado sold to Trio developers. And they're going to be building about 100,000 square feet. In fact, I think that um, one of our speakers here, Tony, can speak to that because he's involved in the leasing of that property. But those things are really very interesting. Now, contrast that with the sales that have happened in Hialeah and um, Northwest Dade. Um, Jose Huncadea just sold a piece of property that was on the market for 30 days for $50 million, a 50-acre uh, tract of land, to Kadena, which will be a very large housing development and not to be outbid, Lennar just closed on a 250 acre property, bought in two different sales and they're paying between 10 and $11 a square foot. So you have these varying disparate prices that drive a person like myself crazy because anymore, where can you measure the value of real estate and how can you really tell, it, it, it really doesn't matter what's happened before, it's the future, people are looking to the future. And there's lots of money and looking for fewer and fewer properties. Um, the other thing that I'd like to talk about are office buildings. And Tony is certainly going to be talking about that, but just let me touch on the kind of investor that's coming in. In December of last year, Ponte Gadia Biscayne LLC bought the Southeast Financial Building. They paid $430 a square foot, one of the highest prices paid. The other gentleman talked about Zara. This is the man who created Zara. His name is Ortega. He's an 80-year-old man. He's a billionaire many, many, many times over. And so he's from Spain. He's come over here because he's looking for the most important thing to him, and that's capital preservation. So he's bought this trophy property, and he is going to, it's about 85% leased, and he's put his money where his mouth is. He's also bought a, a block of property on Lincoln Road and paid the highest price a couple of years ago. So he is, probably has invested almost a billion dollars in Miami so far. Not to be outdone, Sumitomo, that's a Japanese company, purchased the Miami Tower and they paid about $380 a square foot. A building that I think is really interesting is a little further south, that's Ford Datron Center. That sold for $150 million and that's been reported at a six cap. And those prices, uh, the property was 80% occupied and the, the rents are between $38 and $41. Now, what's as, as interesting as what people are buying is the motivation that why are people selling? Because I find it hard to find sellers who are interested in selling their property, they want to hold on to it because they're concerned about what do they put their money into. So Daytron Center bought this at a 6.1 cap. They saw real potential, as Ken Rosen says, for upside value. And certainly that market is great for someone. They wanted to buy it because it was away from the urban core. 1221 Brickle just sold for $380 a square foot. It sold in April. How am I doing for time? I don't want to You're take away on. from. <laughs> okay. I see your notes. <laughs> so, so, 
the sh here's another thing. Shopping centers have been really great, as well as rental properties. A, a shopping center that I think is really interesting, besides the Doral Plaza that just recently sold for $600 a square foot at 41st Street and 97th Avenue, that was sold because the owner, the Leka, is a Sweden firm. They're getting rid of all their properties. So that's a good motivation for them. But I like Steve Battelle's property at Sunnyland. Who among us haven't shopped at Sunnyland? He just sold that property for $800 a square foot at a 4.9 cab. So the, the interesting thing is someone asked Steve, well, why did you sell that property? You owned it for 20 years. He said, you just realized that market, I realized my potential. And yet the one who is buying it is saying there's still more potential there. Because again, capital is looking for a way to invest and preserve their capital. And so Thank I'm going to defer. I was just going to add something before I... Uh, <laughs> And, and then you listen in the news or people talking that we're not have a, a dynamic city, that we are entering a bad cycle, that the economy is not doing great in Miami. We're, we are in Miami. We're in the hottest cities in the world right now. We're going to go to, with Tony and then for age only, right? Tony, uh, Tony uh, to let's talk about something. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about um, office, if you, if you don't mind. And I have a couple of, I mean, you start with saying what you think cap rates are, what's trading, what do you, how do you like it, how do you see it? And then I ask a question that I have sure, prepared no, for you that I no, can give no you problem. before. Well, good morning, and thank you all for staying. I know it's been a long, long uh, event, <laughs> and I know that the prior presentations were a lot more uh, appealing in certain ways with new projects and so forth. So There's a raffle. That's where they're doing it. <laughs> I, knew there was, I knew there was a trick. So, they think um, lunch is being served. I just want to do a little bit of takeoff on what Sandra said. That was a great introduction, a great presentation, and a great overview of really what's happening um, in terms of land values and, and uh, rise of values of buildings and so forth. But, you know, when, when my clients ask me why, you know, what's going on? Why has Miami achieved such a status and so forth? And, you know, two things really come to mind and two tidbits maybe that you guys can take away and maybe things you haven't heard before. But, you know, one for sure is somehow or another over the last 10 years, Miami stopped being a city, stopped being a destination, stopped being a tourist town. And Miami is just a brand. It is one of the most recognizable names anywhere in the world. People want to be associated with Miami. People want to be in Miami. People want to work in Miami. People want to be associated with the, the boom that's going in Miami, you know, anywhere in the world. And, and Sandra said it earlier, just the name itself, you know, in fact, you say the word Miami in a lot of cities in, in South America or in Europe or Asia, and really Miami's from, you know, North Palm Beach County all the way to Key West. To them, it, it doesn't, they don't differentiate, you know, they don't differentiate what the city of Miami is. But, but ultimately, the city of Miami is where it all starts and, and where all the uh, vibrance is and so forth. Um, you know, it's been an unbelievable change in the office world over the last five years. Uh, you know, we had the great recession. Um, you know, everything was in the doldrums. Uh, we stopped building office buildings. Uh, I think we delivered the last three, probably 2008, 2009 buildings, or three significant buildings, two on Brickell Avenue and one in downtown Miami that were finally, you know, started in, in 05, 06 and finally delivered in 08 and 09 for a million and a half, two million square feet. That's the last significant construction of office buildings that, that, that was built. And then obviously, you know, we've seen what unemployment has done and, and, and gone down over the last, uh, I think we're under 5% now in terms of a, of a community and a city here. Um, and, you know, we went from a high of probably, you know, 25, 30% vacancy rates uh, as a city to now 12%, you know, some research reports are tracking it at 9, 10%. There's some pockets like Coconut Grove, like South Miami, like Coral Gables is going through right now, which are now way under 10%. You know, Coconut Grove's at a 5%, South Miami's at a 5%. Uh, Coral Gables is probably going to be, you know, at a uh, 9, 8% as we speak and probably a lot lower here over, over, over the next, you know, 18 months with the amount of activity in the office. And these are existing companies that are growing along with new to market companies that are coming uh, recently from California. We had a, a big group that relocated their, uh, their offices from California here, Latin American office for over 150, 200 employees in the 355 uh, Hamburg building and so forth. So along with vacancy dropping to those really significant uh, low vacancy rates, the amount of buildings that are, have been completed or are in the pipeline for construction is still minimal compared to our you know, I call it a 50 million 
square foot market in terms of buildings greater than 30,000 feet that are in the A and B categories, not necessarily the C and the smaller uh, medical buildings and government buildings and so forth, because the market you know, is over 100 million square feet when you include all the, all the buildings. Um, you know, there's definitely, you know, it's become a landlord's market. It's going to continue to be a landlord's market over the next two to three years as some of these developments that have been announced uh, start to break ground. Sandra mentioned Somi Station. Uh, that's one of our clients that uh, has bought the air rights on a 99-year lease for the, um, uh, on top of the existing parking garage at the, at the South Miami Metro Rail Station. And the air rights, there is one triangular piece of land also where they're going to be building a 100-unit residential price student housing complex and a 200,000 square foot uh, office slash medical office building uh, you know, on that site. It's going through final approvals now with the county and so forth. It's actually a, a, a Miami-Dade County piece because it's on the Metro Rail Station. And Sandra mentioned all the Metro Rail Station um, uh, you know, points of egress and ingress are, are all under development and so forth. That goes along with what Jeff was saying earlier and so forth. You know, everybody wants to be concentrated in these urban areas. Everybody wants access to transportation, alternative forms of transportation. Obviously, the, the driverless cars that, that, that eventually will, will take over, you know, for our driving and so forth. So um, the office market, if you're a landlord, it's, 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 they're coasting right now, raising rents, lowering concessions. You know, rents have probably appreciated in a lot of markets 10% a year for the last three years. I mean, that's significant. You know, let's say high-end Brickell Avenue or downtown, uh, probably was in the under $40 a foot gross in the Great Recession. It's probably closer to $60 now for some of the better buildings, some of the better spaces within the better buildings with water views and so forth, and increasing uh, exponentially as, as we speak because those amount of spaces are limited. There's not a lot. So if you want to, if you're a company that needs that, that kind of building, uh, those kind of views, and those kind of amenities in these large uh, office buildings, then you know that's that's what it takes to, to get into those buildings and so forth. Let me let me just we, we cannot talk about offices without talking about share space. Mm -hmm. How do you see the share space uh, growing? And I, I was reading a couple of days ago that the problem that you have with share space is how bankable are those spaces? Because the bank, I mean, this is a long uh, it's a long term. Ter uh, lease with a very short-term le sub-leases, let's say. Right. So how do you see I it? mean, how historically, uh, what we've always called executive space sharing has been a part of our market forever, for 30 years since I've been in the business so forth. Before the Great Recession and, and prior to that, they were always kind of the tenant of last resort for a lot of landlords, and I represented some of those transactions in downtown of Miami in 92, 94, where, where we had a space that wasn't leasable, it was a sub-lease situation from a major corporation downsizing Miami. We would go out and look for those, you know, shared executive spaces. So they would fill the gap, but they were never considered long-term tenants. What happened is these guys, these, these, this industry, these groups have done a great job of giving the right experience to these individuals and companies that are in their housing, you know, being housed in their in their offices. They took advantage of a high vacancy market in 2007, 8, and 9, when we were in 25, 30, 40 percent vacancies in some building, 50 percent vacancies, and provided a service and a product that caught on fire. Uh, it is unbelievable that is, they're, they're probably, in terms of considering that their industry as a tenant, they're one of the biggest growing tenants that we've had, industries that we've had over the last 10 years. Uh, I can't tell you a building or a market where they're not, if they're not in already, they're knocking on the door trying to get in. And from a financing perspective, historically, yes, that was an issue. But for instance, the WeWorks of the world and the Regis's of the world, which are public entities now, you know, they're backed by Wall Street. That's no longer the case. I can tell you institutional landlords that are very happy to have them as a tenant, and they feel that that business model is here to stay. Um, and, and as Miami grows and attracts businesses from all over the world, a lot of times, uh, and also, I'll get back to another point. Short-term leases are more popular than they've ever been because of the uncertainty of the future of the world, number one. We've also had some, uh, we're, we're undergoing some accounting changes, some federal accounting changes that are gonna take place uh, uh, January 1st, 2019, that are going to uh, uh, basically have corporations put long-term lease liabilities in their balance sheets, which it didn't do before. So ownership by some companies will become more valuable to them in terms of how their books look, and I'm not an expert on that, but. But you're going to see more and more in that. And I think the public companies will take effect January 1st of 19 and then uh, the private entities a, a year down the road and so forth. So that's also going to affect how, how some of this is used. So landlords have to start just like we're looking at garages and seeing what kind of alternative views down the road they could be. Um, and I think we heard residential for the American uh, Dream Miami. 
uh, which is interesting. Um, we're also looking at, you know, landlords have to accept that shorter term leases are something they have to deal with if they're going to keep their buildings occupied. Um, mm -hmm. and, and again, a lot of these tenants will roll over for 10 or 15 years, but it's going to be in three to five year increments over time and so forth. Thank you. Rafael, now is your turn. I need a question or something. <laughs> yeah. What's yeah. your name? They, these folks brought prepared speeches. I, I got nothing. <laughs> I got nothing. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I'm, I'm Rafael. I'm a vice president of retail continental real estate companies. The, um, I'm here to talk about the retail piece. The, um, the hot topic of, it seems like the hot topic of today was that my business will cease to exist. <laughs> Inside of so you're looking inside right of my lease <laughs> at home. <laughs> and you're gonna live to be 150. I, uh, <laughs> we, we, we will see. We will see. The uh, unemployment at my house will be 100 percent. The uh, <laughs> yeah, right. So I mean, obviously, I disagree. The uh, this is a this is a room full of real estate professionals. So we don't get to watch CNN and say the retail meltdown is happening because there's X amount of malls closing down, because there's X amount of Macy's closing down. The American Dream is building a bunch of stuff, that's great, but what they're building on the residential side, that's all that they're doing outside of retail. Bowling, restaurants, theme parks, all of it is retail. So they can sit there and say that they're building a million square feet of small shop space and that's stupid, and that might be the case but they're building three million square feet of retail. If they're telling you anything different, that's not right. 17% only is what regional malls represent of all retail. So if you were to sit here and you were to say, fine, half of all malls will go broke. Dadeline goes away, Aventura sticks around, and that goes on throughout the entire country. You're talking about with a nation, national vacancy rate of 5%, we're still doing pretty good we're still never going to reach the vacancy rates that the office sector reached in the, right, in the Great Recession. We are not in any kind of trouble. I mean, and at the end of the day, the meltdown sells newspapers or newsletters or emails or whatever people That's are reading now. But find me a dead circuit city. Where are the dead blockbusters? Where are the dead, more recently, where are the dead sports authorities? We fill them as fast as we get them back. We've, yeah. We fill them with all kinds of different retail. We fill them with gyms. We fill them with movie theaters. We fill them with bowling. We fill them with whatever you got. It's all retail. The reason why we get more press is because nobody at home in Wisconsin is affected when a Regis goes broke in downtown Miami. But all of a sudden, you've got to figure out where you're going to go get your groceries. Now that affects you at home in Wisconsin. It affects you everywhere. The, the moderator before did this great exercise, and it was real impacting, and he said, raise your hands if you're an Amazon Prime member. I would challenge you to raise your hand if you did groceries this week. <laughs> I did. Nobody. Nobody did groceries. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Whoa. All right, we, we yeah, got but, one person. But I think yeah, Jose, I think Jose said whole something food. very interesting. Danny, Danny, two seconds. I think Jose Concadella said something very interesting that only, uh, he, I, I wrote it, 9% of the retail is e-commerce. 9%. So yes, they have a lot, long time to grow and they have a, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a booming business, but still we go to the retail stores. What about medical? Hmm? medical? Absolutely. I mean, every service use that you see out there, medical, pediatric, uh, you know, we just did, it's funny, Sandra mentioned two shopping centers, they're all Plaza and Sunnyland, and we manage at least both of those. Um, so I mean, at Sunnyland, for example, the Miami Children's took over two floors at Sunnyland. That's retail. I mean, it's uh, the urgent cares, all of it is retail. So at the end of the day, out of 100 potential stores, we've got three and a half stores vacant today. And you can ask anyone that's out there looking for space that it's not easy. We don't do the type of concessions that they do on the industrial and the office side. It is a very, very tight market. Nationwide, we're at 5%. In Miami-Dade County, we're at 3.5% vacancy. Uh, and what are the rates? Rates are only going up, and they're very, very dependent on the market. Um, but you've got as high as $300, $350 a square foot in the design district, and as low as 
teens in some other markets. Like Danny has a question. A couple of questions. Okay. First of all, I think you did a great job from downtown Dayton. It was phenomenal. Uh, you know, Sandy sold it. Sunny and I when Paranova sold it. I have two clients in that mall. They're paying $100 a foot rent. Wagons West, which is a little nothing coffee shop, is paying $100 a foot rent. So it's effective. You know, these people are buying these malls. It's a triple net basis. So <coughs> the next year, when taxes come down, insurance comes down, it's very hard for these people to stay in business. Some of the rents, and you're not going for winter, I'm a winter person. Uh, I'm friends with Red Sky. I drove around with Michael, and I said, Michael, explain this to me, because I'm a CCM, and I do not understand these numbers. And Michael said to me, <coughs> We're in the third inning of a ninth inning ball game. And I thought we were in double overtime. So you know, I think we're going to have, what, over 60,000 condos permitted in Bay County. Whatever those get built, you know, dollars strong. A lot of those are going to, I'm putting a fund together to buy foreclosed condos in the next couple of years. But I think we're going to go in for a recession. In I sell industrial real estate. Industrial real estate is great. We have 3% vacancy. I can't talk people into market because they can't find what to do with the money. But, but you're speaking think, about apartments, Danny, and so what's happening is... But they're going to be rentals at $3,000. Exactly. So they're going to pay $4 million for a program. So I think that's going to affect the... the uh, I mean, Tony might know better than me or maybe Ralph, but I think that's going to affect the commercial real estate, especially retail, and you know, hotels, Airbnb. It's going to change. It's changing very quickly. Yeah, the way we're... This is sort of the beginning of the dollars a foot triple net this, rent. One of, the, one of the biggest challenges that I see for us, even if you have a designation, you see a gem and you pretend that you understand this, is that there is no way to, under, uh, 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 to put a deal together with, with, with your mind together. The numbers don't add up. But, but, yet, but yet, look at the Sandra's statistics. I think one of the problems that we have is perception, that we still think that Miami is not what we, what we, we, we think that we think that we, what it is, but we don't know exactly what Miami is. So Miami Paris. is not the Miami that we know from the past. Miami is New York, Miami is Milan, Miami is, and even some more dynamics here because we are a very new city. I, I, that's my view. No, I'm no I want to address Kate Danny's Kate. question, though. Yes. The, um, Wagons West has been there for 20 years or so. The, uh, you're talking about one of the single most successful restaurants at Sunnyland. I'm not going to sit here and spread out what their sales per square foot are, but they're fine. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the reason why the malls are in such deep trouble and the mall guys are gone, and I was hoping that they would be here. Simon, General Growth, and Westfield did it to themselves. The, uh, I worked at Simon prior to Crack, so I know exactly what's going on. The, uh, the benchmark at the mall, in the mall business is you want your operators to be between 18 and 22% occupancy cost higher in the food court. I heard recently that Cam at Aventura Mall is up to 100 bucks a foot, just the Cam. The, uh, these guys are doing it to themselves. They, they have entire meetings to talk about how to drive up occupancy costs, how to get these guys to pay more. The problem with e-commerce, and it's 8% that they are as a, as a portion of total sales. I looked it up last night because I was nervous about today. <laughs> yeah. So you did prepare. So, yes. I'll, I looked up the sure one stack because I figured that's where they were going to dig me on. Amazon, Amazon, Amazon. That's why I quoted Jose. Yeah. It's not right, my right, right. <laughs> But the deal with that is, so if you've got somebody operating at 22% occupancy costs, and then all of a sudden you take away, call it a direct effect, you take away 8% of their sales, and now all of a sudden they're not doing the volume that they were doing, you're putting people out of business. So the lion's share of the vacancy that's going to hit, back, hit the market to the tune of 50 million square feet is Macy's, Sears, JCPenney. All of these guys are operating inside of mall, but also you've got the BCBGs, you've got the BBs, you've got all of these other guys that are operating inside of a mall. So if you've got, if you go into your mall and you see a tenant that operates exclusively inside the mall, you can safely say that those guys are or will be at some point in trouble. And that's the, just a fact. We have the last question for Ken. Oh, about sea level rise. So I kind of passed it off because we own some choice properties in Coral Gables and 
you know, we're building a Doral, and, but I wouldn't buy anything on Miami Beach because it's so low without her being concerned. But you see in the media now, and the, the first speaker, I guess he was the, from the Knight Frank organization, who said that 100 years from now there won't be a place called Earth. It'll disappear. So uh, she is urging me to sell all the properties that we have in Miami-Dade County and reinvest in higher areas like Asheville, North Carolina. The well, moon. and I'm looking at a deal in Asheville. It's a phenomenal deal, not because of Seawide, because of something else. But um, what impact? I mean, the realtors and the developers don't want to talk about this particularly. And I don't think it's going to happen right away. But at some point, if the media starts to talk about Seawise, what do you think the impact on investors is going to be around the world for Miami? Because Miami may be underwater in 20, 30, 40, 50 years. This is you guys. I can be I funny about this, but this is all you guys. Want to reply and then just say a couple of things because we have, we're out of time. It's a tough one. I, I will say one thing about it. I think we have to have a story. We have to have a narrative on things that the, that are being done in Miami Beach, in, in Dade County, and all three counties, because things are being done. That there's drainage and things like that, and there are going to be solutions in the future. Some of which be public, private, and some not. But I think we need to at least have that narrative. We need to be able to answer that question when somebody asks us. We actually are looking at doing a position paper already started and collated so that you can have that information if somebody asks you. Maybe that's why labor prices are so high. Maybe you might be a little higher. Okay. John, no, very quickly, John. Yeah, just to that, I would just say that we're going to do that. 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 we Right. It's going up 10 feet. It's still enough to flood all of Miami, but it's not enough to cover a, a 50 short building. It's not even enough to cover a 30 foot warehouse. You build them so that they can put built on top of it. You guys, I think sea level rise is, is going to be five centimeters. Where it's where it's where it's where it's where it's where it's Wait, thank you very much guys. Uh, <laughs>